Hello again, friends. Uh, so the title is not clickbait. It is not something that I'm lying about. I do genuinely love the anime slash manga series Naruto. I haven't done much with the Weeaboo Corner lately, so I've been planning something kind of like this for a little while, and I figured, you know what, I, I have an open spot in the schedule. Let's just talk about it. This is the introduction song. It's not very good, but it's not too long. So Naruto is a very famous anime slash manga series, which even if you're not into anime and manga, you have probably heard of it. I don't think I need to give too much of an introduction about it, but basically it is very indicative of 2000s anime and manga, specifically shonen. Now, if you're unfamiliar, shonen is just the Japanese word for boy, and when we're talking about manga, it usually just means manga that's aimed at young boys from the age of like, I don't know, 8 to 18-ish. I'm sure someone else has exact numbers out there, but, you know, because of that, it's stuff that tends to focus on, like, action and fighting and boobs and just being the coolest, best coolest guy you can. You know, that sort of thing. And Naruto is very indicative of the way that Shonen was in the 2000s. And I'm mainly going to be referring to the manga here because this is a channel that's about books and talking about the anime would be a little too far off topic, but the anime also follows the story of the manga, and that's what I watched first, so I will be using clips from it and stuff, but whatever, not important, they're basically the same thing. And specifically, Naruto is a story about magical ninjas doing magical ninja things, and based on that, it is pretty much what you would expect, at least at first, because the series gets kind of weird after a while, uh, but, you know, it's, it's what you would expect. It has a bad reputation among both people who are fans of anime and people who are not, and for, for good reason. You know, there are many, many problems here which I see and I do acknowledge. You know, there's stuff like plot holes, uh, there's a bunch of side characters which get pushed to the side after a while and they just become completely static, they don't change. Uh, there's some interesting themes at the beginning, but they get kind of overruled later on by later events. And of course, there is the ever-present shonen power creep, which basically just means at the beginning it's fairly grounded in terms of the powers and abilities people are using. You know, they're still fucking running up walls and walking on water and shooting out fire dragon balls and stuff. Or, not dragon balls, uh, fire dragons and stuff. But it, by the end, they're like summoning meteors to crush entire armies and such, and it just it gets a little stupid when you compare it to what was at the beginning. It It is a very real problem that a lot of series suffer from, and Naruto is no exception. So I do acknowledge all these problems exist. As for the reasons I really just love this series though, uh, let's finally get back into that. So the first one is probably the simplest and the easiest to understand. It's what got me into anime. You know, it's the first one I ever really watched, and then I read the manga so I could uh, read beyond where it was, because it was still ongoing at that point and I just really loved it, and then I started getting into other, more similar stuff, you know? So, if it weren't for Naruto, I would never have gotten into series with, like, just incredible action, like Bleach. Uh, I would never have seen, or slash read, uh, other series which just have amazing stories, like Berserk, or Death Note, or Code Geass, and I would never have come into contact with the sheer insanity of things like Gurren Lagann and Gamblefish, which I, I've talked a little bit about Gamblefish before. It's like one of the final villains of the story is Barack Obama. I mean, it's it's so stupid, but I love it. You know, like just things like that. I would not have gotten to experience things like that if I hadn't uh, experienced Naruto first. So for that reason, I'm very grateful for it. And that's pretty simple to understand, I think. The next reason is just that the action is really, really good. You know, it is a combination of martial arts and magic, but... The magic isn't just basic, okay, we're throwing fireballs or we're summoning lightning or something, uh, which you would expect, and there is some of that, but some of it also just gets really weird. Like, people making clones of themselves. That's one of the main things Naruto does when he fights. He'll make, like, eight copies of himself, and the copies will disappear if they get a solid hit, or if they get hit solidly, but, you know, there's still a huge advantage that he can uh, utilize in combat. Uh, there's people that have, like, x-ray vision, there's people that can, uh, create bones, 
like it's it's very strange like he can grow his own bones make them come out of his skin and make them ultra hard and sharp and stuff and use them as weapons it's it's very strange and just things like that you know they they're more unique than you would expect them to be at first and quite frankly i think a lot of uh, western fantasy writing could use a little more um variety in the types of magic that they use like and if you're looking for inspiration for that then i would suggest checking out some anime and manga because they can get weirdly creative with it the action is really kinetic like even when it's in the manga and it's still images you can just feel how quickly everything's moving around and if you ever watch the anime you can see how quickly everything's moving around which makes it just a lot of fun to watch See, when I was a kid, pretty much the only anime that I ever saw was like the occasional episode of Dragon Ball Z when it was on TV, and I straight up do not like Dragon Ball Z. Like, that's a controversial take, I know, but I just, I don't like it because 90% of the fighting is just characters standing around screaming, Aah! while rocks rise up around them, and it's just, eh, it's, it just never really grabbed me, uh, whereas Naruto didn't have that problem, and plus, it's very tactical. You know, when, when people win fights, it's not just because, at least early in the series, like later on it becomes more about just creating bigger energy blasts than the other guy, but at the beginning of the series at least, when you win, it's not just because you can punch better than the other guy, although that is a factor, and it's not because you can summon more magic energy than the other guy, although again, that is a factor. It's because, well, you, you can come up with plans on the fly. You know, like, like, uh, in an early fight where they're fighting uh, Zabuza, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute, uh, Naruto and Sasuke have to work together and like hide and use misdirection and stuff in order to catch him off guard. But not quite enough. Huh? I told you a shuriken can't touch me. <laughs> what? Or at least it's not something I had seen very often at the time. And I remember I first really started to get into Naruto as a character when I started to see how quickly he could come up with battle plans on the fly like that. And I just, I really liked it. It was something impressive that he could do, which endeared me to him. And all of the fights, again, at the beginning of the series, are built up to really, really well. Because at the end of the day, yes, you can entertain your audience a bit just by showing uh, movement on the screen, you know, fights where they don't really care about the outcome, but <laughs> it's still just entertaining because people are fighting. You can do that for a little while, but you never really, really get into them unless you actually care about what's going on. Like, because at the end of the day, it is uh, just trying to show the characters reaching a goal, but you're doing it in a visually interesting way. And most of the fights here are built up to really well. And so you actually care about what's going on, and that just makes them much more intense. You know, you have Rock Lee versus Gara, which is a great fight, and that's basically all about how, okay, does hard work actually overcome talent eventually? There's Sakura when she fights Sasori, and that's basically showing off how, hey, Sakura's not useless anymore like she was near the beginning of the series. And granted, she does become useless later on again, but... I just, I just didn't even care. Like, even looking back, I, I don't care. Like, it's nice to see her actually be useful and become a true ninja in her own right. I mentioned this earlier, but there's Team 7 versus Zabuza. That's a good way of showcasing just how far they have to go. Because, you know, they're still in training, and this guy is an elite ninja who actually can very easily kill them if they're not careful and so well one it shows just how far they have to go and two it forces them to actually work together as a team because this is their first real mission as a team and it forces them to learn how to uh, communicate better with one another and it helps them bond and become friends and of course there is naruto versus sasuke at the valley of the end which is uh it's kind of hard to go into a lot of detail about that without just sitting here for 10 minutes explaining all the context, but basically you are watching friends be torn apart by their different philosophies on life and 
you really want Naruto to defeat Sasuke because he can drag him back home and Sasuke doesn't go through this whole very elaborate suicide attempt, which is basically what's going on there. And plus, I just have personal attachment to it because the first time I saw it was a friend of mine showing it to me trying to get me into Naruto, and so we spent like an hour and a half watching it, and it was just a lot of fun. And then there's Naruto himself as the protagonist, who is very relatable at first. You know, he is a lonely outcast, and he doesn't really have any friends at the beginning of the story. Uh, he is a screw-up, you know, he's not particularly good at being a ninja at first, but he is good at one or two things. Like, again, I mentioned he can make uh, shadow clones of himself much better than most other people can. Even elite ninja are not as good at doing that as he is when he's just a kid. Uh, and so it's just really nice to watch him become better at things and uh, become stronger and finally gain some friends and gain a family and he has really big dreams and at first it seems far-fetched that he'd be able to uh, follow those dreams but after a while he eventually does and so when the epilogue comes around and he finally has become the leader of their village which was his dream the whole time and he finally uh, has friends and he is respected and acknowledged by his peers and uh, he has a wife and children like you're you're happy for him and Granted uh, he kind of becomes the chosen one after a while, which is lame, but I, It didn't completely ruin things for me. You know, I just I, again. I mentioned before that when he starts uh, Showing off how quick how much of a quick thinker he is and how talented he is at coming up with plans in battle that also endeared me to him but even before that, he was just relatable. I understood him. I understood that sort of loneliness. I understood that desire to prove yourself. And it just made him a really great character. So even later on when he becomes less good, I still was watching him. The series also has a really large cast of unique characters that I just really liked. So, you know, back when Naruto was big, everybody had their own favorite. And the thing is, the cast does get a little too big later on, and it... Make, it gets to a point where a lot of characters just don't have screen time, they aren't able to show off anything, and they aren't able to develop beyond uh, one or two gimmicks a piece. but, you know, it's still, it's still great. You know, I still remember their personalities, I remember their different uh, fighting styles, I remember their very distinct character designs. It was, it was, it was very good, it was a lot of fun. Like, I remember Rock Lee's optimism, I remember Sasuke's emo cynicism, and I totally understood it too, because while yes, looking back on it, it was kind of annoying how emo he was, he is a literal child whose family was murdered. It makes sense why he would have such a bleak outlook on things. And I remember the cute crush that Hinata had on Naruto. Like, it, these characters all stood out, and they were all unique in their own ways. I, I just liked uh, being able to experience that. And as the story goes on, we get to watch them grow up, we watched it, We get to watch them become more powerful, and eventually we watch them replace the old generation that uh, came before them. And the thing is, that's just how the real world works. That's uh, one of the interesting themes about Naruto, is how eventually, yes, uh, even if you are a kid now, eventually you will grow up and you will be the adult and you will uh, be the ones in charge of society and then it's up to you to be a caretaker for the next generation. And then the cycle repeats. Like, it's uh, very... It, it's very subtle, but... Or, maybe not very subtle, but... It is a very interesting part of that series, which I just don't see done very often. You know, it... Uh, I normally don't like it when sequels come out that are just cashing in on the success of an earlier big series, but it, it works in this case, even though I don't watch Boruto, because, well, that was just what the original series was about. And there are a whole bunch of really, really powerful, intimidating villains here. Now, I've mentioned before that fundamentally a villain has to be an obstacle. You know, they have to be something that stops the heroes from reaching their goal. And yes, people like to focus on, uh, oh, okay, give your villains personality, give them their own unique motivations, that sort of thing. That's all very important, yes, but on a fundamental level, they do have to function as an obstacle. They have to feel like they can actually stop the heroes from accomplishing their goal, and if they don't do that, then they just don't work as villains. Team 7's first major mission, they have to fight Zabuza, who, as I said, was a fucking monster. He is an elite ninja. He's legendary even among uh, more powerful ninja, 
and they have to find a way to somehow defeat him, and plus, in the English dub, he just has a really, really cool voice. Nice try. But I'm not that easy to fool. Orochimaru is also super powerful, and he's also just extremely creepy. Granted, I didn't like when they brought him back for the President Trump arc, but, y you know, it, it, whatever, it's not a big deal. And the thing is, he's not just a threat because he's super powerful and he can fight better. He's a threat because he can manipulate people and because he's intelligent. Like, he manipulates uh, Sasuke, Naruto's best friend, into basically like I said before, committing suicide in a very elaborate way because he plays on his emotions and his desire to get revenge that well. And so that's someone that you can't uh, just defeat by punching him really hard. Like, that's uh, an interesting villain. The Akatsuki, <laughs> man, everybody, everybody loves the Akatsuki, you know? Like, they're just really cool. I, I don't have a lot else to add. But, I, I mean, again, in addition to that, they're very strong. When one of the Akatsuki shows up, you know shit's about to go down. And I could sit here and talk about all of them, really, but I'm just gonna mention Sasori, who Sakura got to fight, and he was really cool, and he was, like, the first big fight with one of the Akatsuki, where they finally showed that, yes, they can be beaten, but you're gonna have to sacrifice some stuff along the way, and it will be very difficult, and if you screw up even once, you will die, so that still worked really well. And then, of course, there's Pain, who is the leader of the Akatsuki, and he is... One, just super powerful, like, he manages to destroy an entire village full of ninja by himself when he's looking for Naruto, and then on top of that, he just has a really interesting philosophy towards life. So, he works really well as a villain, too. And now, this world shall know pain. There's the Nine-Tailed Fox, which is this unkillable demon they had to seal away in Naruto to make sure that it didn't go crazy and destroy everything, and I mean, that works as a villain because, again, you can't kill it, and you can't run away from it. It's always going to be with Naruto, so he has to find a way to control it over the course of the series, and it works surprisingly well. And hell, even the boring villains in this series still kind of work because they're just really powerful and intimidating. Like uh, Madara Uchiha, very boring character. He has nothing to him other than, haha, I am strong and I look down on all of you. But he also gets to summon fucking asteroids to come down and destroy entire armies. He also gets to summon a weird energy Gundam, which can slice mountains in half. You know, he, he does things like that. And when he first shows up and you see what he can do, you're really left wondering, how the hell are they going to beat this guy? And that becomes one of the big questions near the end of the series. And finally, this series has some really smart commentary on the cycle of violence. Now, I mentioned before that there are some uh, interesting themes that come up early in this series, which are kind of overturned by the end, which is unfortunate, but that's one that sticks with it. Like, it really shows how if you do something violent to someone, then their loved ones will come to get revenge, and if they succeed in that, then your loved ones will come to get revenge against them, and then it goes back and forth, and sometimes people get caught up in the crossfire, and so it just creates this vicious cycle, and eventually you have to nip that in the bud. This is done extremely well with the character of Sasuke. You know, for most of the series, he is just trying to get revenge on his brother, who killed the rest of their family, which is, you know, a very understandable motivation, but then when he gives up everything in his life to gain more power so that he can do it, he risks uh, his own life, he gives up all his friends, he gives up his place in his village, he knows he can never go back home, and then he kills his brother, and then what's left for him. And he realizes, well, there, there isn't anything left, so he just has to pick a new target to try and single-mindedly go off and kill. And it, you realize it leaves Sasuke just kind of empty as a person, and that revenge doesn't solve anything. And then, of course, there is Pain, the villain I mentioned earlier, who he realized that, okay, people are just going to keep fighting wars forever, so what we have to do is we have to make the cost of fighting wars too high, so his whole goal was to create really powerful weapons which will cause mass suffering uh, whenever they're used, and then people will step back and realize, okay, we cannot fight wars anymore, we're gonna have peace for a while, and eventually people would forget and they'd do it again, but they would again realize, okay, this destruction is too much, and so he was specifically going out of his way to try and create this cycle so that we could have those periods of peace in the middle, and 
you might have issues with this philosophy, but it is at least a philosophy. You know, it is an ethos that a villain has, and it... I can't really find too many flaws with it. <laughs> like, I'm not saying it's like a foolproof plan or anything, I'm just saying he kind of does have a point. So that's about everything, at least in broad strokes, uh, and yeah, at the end of the day, Naruto does have some pretty significant issues, and I acknowledge those, but I, I still love it. You know, I still love it as a series, uh, both for nostalgic value and for uh, once in a while going back and, like, watching one of the fights on YouTube or something. You know, it's just a lot of fun. So, um, if you made it this far, thanks a bunch. Uh, subscribe to my channel, follow me on Goodreads, follow me on Twitter, all that kind of stuff. Uh, bye. Hello, and thank you for watching this far. If you did, you have my thanks. And if you see all these names here, those are my patrons. My $10 and up patrons are... Apo Savalainen, Olivia Rayan, Brother Santodes, Buffy Valentine, Carolina Clay, Dan Anselievich, Dark King, Echo, Flax, Great Grebo, Karkat Kitsune, Liza Rudakova, Lord Tiebreaker, Madison Lewis Bennett, Marilyn Roxy, Matthew Baudreau, Micaphone, Peep the Toad, Return of Cardamom, Sad Mardigan, Sillier the Vixen, Tesla Shark, Vivixis, and Wesley. All of you are great. If you want to get your name up here, then consider becoming a patron. If you can't do that, then you could also become a YouTube channel member, or just like the video, comment, and subscribe to share it around, and uh, help me eat food this month. Uh, yeah, thanks. Goodbye.